Hello, folks. How's it going? Hope you're all well. You're very welcome to another Saturday session here of Junior Cycle History at examrevision.ie. So in this lesson, we're going to focus on technology and historical change. OK, so if we look at our strands, we must explore the contribution of technological developments and innovation to historical change. OK, so basically we have to look at a number of different new technologies, inventions, uh, developments and see how they have contributed to historical change, how they have changed the way people live, work, etc, etc. So today's lesson, we're going to focus or base it around an exam question. OK, so the question at the top there, discuss three technological innovations that you have studied and explain how they contributed to historical change. All right. Now, this question is worth 18 marks. So that tells me that I need to make at least six valid relevant points because each valid relevant relevant point I make is worth three marks. OK, so, for example, I could, for example, name uh, name my three technological innovations and explain how each of them has contributed to uh, historical change. Uh, that could probably bring me up to my 18 marks. OK, so each valid re relative point is worth three marks developing and explaining these points further. OK, is worth another three marks. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through a number of different technological innovations, how they contributed to historical change. And then towards the end of the lesson, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a sample answer for this. OK. So I've gone back to this slide here and um, so discuss three technological innovations you have studied and explain how they contributed to historical change. So practice writing this yourself. OK, and try and use different information to what I to, to, to what I put in my sample answer. OK, um, really good. A really good way to practice, guys, is but just by using a simple we call it retrieval practice. So, you know, you might watch this video, then you might just go back to this slide here and you might just try and write out an answer yourself. OK, without looking at your notes. And this is a really good way. This really cements the information in your brain. OK. If you have to go and retrieve it yourself. So I'd really recommend you do that, guys. OK, try and answer this question yourself. Um, maybe try and use some different information that I had in my sample answer. But if you use the same information, that's fine. But try and do it yourself. Try and do it yourself. See how you get on. And if you feel you're missing some key points, then you can you can watch the video or look at your notes and add them in at the end. OK, but try and write six good, solid points about three different pieces of, of technological innovations by yourself. OK, folks, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in our next Saturday session. So this lesson, OK, we will look at three different historical innovations. In fact, that's actually a lie. We're going to look at four. OK, so the, the four we're going to look at, we have the printing press. We're going to look at advances in sea transport and navigation. So that's our caravel ship. And we're going to look at the steam engine as well. All right. Now. The great thing about this topic is you'll probably have covered most of these throughout the course of your junior cycle history course. Like you should have done the printing press during the Renaissance. All right. Like you should you should know who invented it, how it worked and what some of the impacts of it were. You should have done like, for example, the caravel ship during the age of explorations. OK, so why was the caravel significant? And, you know, other navigation equipment, your, your telescope, your log and line, your quadrant, etc. You may have done the steam engine. You may have done the Industrial Revolution and you may have covered the steam engine. So we're going to look at that. Now, we're going to look at a fourth one today as well. We're going to look at the airplane. Now, you may have looked at the airplane when you did, for example, the Second World War. OK, you may have looked at the developments in military technology and how they contributed to historical change. All right. So we're going to look at four of them today because we need to know three in detail for our sample answer. So the first piece of technological development we're going to look at is the, the printing press. OK, and the printing press was invented in 1450 by a German goldsmith called Johannes Gutenberg. Now, again, the, the really good thing about this guy is, is you probably have already done this during the Renaissance. So we're just going to make sure that we, you know, we recap over it and we know how to put this information into a sample answer. OK, and Gutenberg developed the printing press using a method known as movable type. Really simple. Basically, he would move letters onto a frame and these would then be pressed, literally pressed onto paper to type onto the paper. 
and then these will be changed again. Okay, so individual letters were placed on a special frame to make an entire page of writing. These would then be pressed onto a page. Okay, really simple. So how they, what they'd work is they might arrange all the letters for page one of a Bible. Okay, and they would print page one of the Bible maybe a hundred times. So they print and then they 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 repaint letters with more ink, print again, and and just just repeat that process. Okay, and um, you know the, the printing press was fantastic. The printing press could print three hundred sheets of paper in one day. So very often what they do is like they have maybe a a building that had a number of printing presses and like a printing company, if you will. So they might have five printing presses. So in this image here, we can actually there's two of them here. There's more to the left here that we can't see, and you know, five printing presses, each churning out 300 pages a day. So it was quite an efficient operation. Okay. And in 1955, Gutenberg printed an edition of the Bible containing over 1,200 pages. And that was known as the Gutenberg Bible. That was like the first kind of major publication of um, from the printing press. Okay. And um, just a, a, an interesting point. So the printing press, when I say it was invented by Johannes Gutenberg. It, it was the first European to invent a printing press was Johannes Gutenberg. But they reckon the origins of the printing press are actually in South Korea, that a South Korean inventor invented the first printing press. And it was just later the Europeans also invented it. Now, there's also zero evidence that Gutenberg copied the South Koreans idea. OK, I suppose it would have been, you know, back then it would have been very difficult for information to pass that quickly. So Gutenberg, you know, came up with this idea himself. But it just so happened someone else had already come up with the idea as well um, down in South Korea. So the key thing we need to know, guys, is how did the printing press contribute to historical change? That's vital. OK, well, the first big impact is printed books became much cheaper. So think about it, like because printed books could be churned out way quicker and, and, and in you know, great quantities, there was it means that they became cheaper. OK. It's just the basic law of supply and demand. The less of something there is, the more expensive it'll be. So before the printing press, all books were handwritten. So there's very few really knocking around. Because think of think how long it would take you to write a Bible from from you know from hand. So the printing press meant that books could be churned out maybe a hundred times quicker. So there was more of them and they became cheaper. Now another impact of books becoming cheaper is more people learn to read and write because more people could you know get their hands on books. I mean. This is back in the you know fifteen and sixteen hundreds. Uh, if there's no books, you can't read or write. There's no you know Edmodo or any of these apps to help you learn to read and write. So books were what people relied on to read and write. Okay, uh, a, a third impact of the printing press was writing in the vernacular languages became very widespread, and this replaced the use of Latin. Okay, so all like all writings before the printing press were kind of done in Latin. Now, the problem was most people couldn't speak Latin at all, but Latin was the official language of the Catholic Church. All right. Now, once more people learned to read and write, they began demanding books in their own language. So a French person would want a book in French, an English person would want a book in English, a German person would want a book in German, etc. And this idea that you write in your native vernacular language gradually replaced Latin. Okay. Um, a fourth impact of the printing press was the influence of the Catholic Church would decline. OK, um, for example, the Reformation. This is a big thing. During the Reformation, a lot of the abuses in the Catholic Church and corruption in the Catholic Church was exposed. And news of this spread because because of the printing press. OK, um, for example, Martin Luther. Here we have this is Martin Luther nailing his 95 thesis to the church door in Wittenberg. All right. And, and he's he, these 95 theses, he translated them into German and then he's, he used the printing press to distribute these. OK, so the you know people lost faith in the Catholic Church because they began to see the wrongdoings and corruption within the church. Further, I suppose, ideas such as heliocentrism, the idea of, you know, that that the church used, used to teach that the, the earth was the center of the universe. Heliocentrism was the idea that the moon was at the center of the universe. And this would have been a very, very anti-Catholic church view. And these ideas also spread because of the printing press. Another thing that became popular was literature. So literature became more popular and writers such as William Shakespeare rose to prominence. Again, like think about it, like, like if you were a writer and you wrote plays and poems and stories, like you're not going to become popular or make any money if people literally can't access your writing. 
So because of the printing press, books and things were printed and, and distributed. So William Shakespeare became popular. It's a bit like, you know, if, if you're a filmmaker, you're not going to make any money or become famous if there's no Netflix or DVDs or cinemas, because who's going to see your movies? So the printing press provided a, like a way of, of writers to, to spread their literature to the masses. And then guys like William Shakespeare became very, very popular. Okay, guys, the second major technological development we're going to look at is the Caraval ship as well as navigation equipment. Okay, and we're going to look at these and then examine how they contributed to historical change. Again, you probably have an idea of this. Like the Caraval ship allowed in Spanish and Portuguese explorers to go on large scale voyages of exploration and, you know, and conquer new lands in the Americas, for example. Okay, so the Caraval ship. Again, this is a Portuguese ship that was very strong, very maneuverable, very sturdy, and was capable of exploring really rough oceans and seas. Okay, And the Caraval ship was designed by, it combined many of the best features of European ships at the time. It was clinker -built. And what this meant is that the hull was really strong. OK, so the ships were stronger and this is important because like these ships were going to be sailing across the Atlantic Ocean where the seas got very, very rough. So they needed strong hulls. All right. And uh, ultimately, the ships could be bigger. The ships could be built way bigger. All right. Again, that was important. You needed a big ship to carry enough people and supplies. Like these voyages went on for weeks and months. OK, so a big ship was vital and a big ship, again, was stronger. Caraval ships also had a very important feature. They had square and Latin sails. So basically square and triangular sails. And this meant that the ship could sail with and against the wind. So this is very, very important. Okay. It meant that the ship wasn't totally reliant on, you know, a wind from one particular direction to, to, to I suppose, propel itself forward. The square and Latin sails meant that regardless of the wind, the ship could be propelled forward. A caravel, they also had rudders, okay? So we might think of a rudder today as a very basic thing, but the rudder is the little flap at the back of a boat that steers it. So these made them extremely maneuverable and aided steering, okay? Again, being maneuverable was good. It allowed them to explore inlets and harbors very easily. Caravel ships also had watchtowers called castles, okay? So this is a watchtower up here. And these are very important because these basically allowed a crew to not only sight land, but also sight potential enemy ships from distance. OK, um, pirate ships, uh, you know, for example, a Spanish explorer might encounter a Portuguese ship and that could be, you know, that could be trouble. So castles are very important. Now, as well as caravel ships, we also had other major major developments which would contribute to historical change so as well as ships we also had uh, an improvements in navigation equipment okay now some of these are very simple and they might seem simple to us but at the time you know in, in the 1400s these were big big developments so firstly the invention of the compass allowed sailors to tell which direction they are sailing in like that's pretty simple, but that was vital. So, you know, if you, for example, set sail from Spain and you, you're, you're trying to go to the Americas, you know you need to sail west, okay? And having a simple compass, like we, we kind of take a compass for granted now. I mean, all our phones have compasses, but back then this was a piece, uh, a big, big, important piece of technology, okay? A second piece of navigation or second and third piece of navigation equipment that was invented were astrolabes and quadrants. And these are vital. These are used to determine how far north or south, um, you know, he was from the equator or she was from the equator. All right. And they basically worked by looking at the north star. And I suppose they would measure this with the horizon. And these were, again, very, very important. Um, again. It meant that you knew you were on the correct trajectory. You weren't sailing too far north or south or you weren't being blown off course. And again, these allowed sailors to, like, these gave sailors the confidence to go on large scale explorations, you know? Like, 
you're not going to go and sail into the unknown if you have no idea where you're going or no idea how, how you're going to remain on course okay so again the combination of the caravel and this navigation equipment kind of gave sailors the confidence to go on these large-scale explorations that, that we're talking about here another vital piece of our uh, so vital development was maps maps became more and more detailed okay and these new maps were called portal and charts and they're far better than the old maps. So the size, shape, and area of land masses and coastal areas became far more accurate on modern maps. So if you look here, this is a map of Italy, okay? You'll notice it is quite detailed, right? You'll also notice along the coastline, there is writing. So that writing, that writing basically is, har that those are harbors. Okay, harbors and other pieces of useful information that sailors might know. For example, that one coastline is particularly rugged, so to for you know the, it's like a warning. Okay, and these you know these maps again, simple thing to us. All our phones have them; we take them for granted. But back in the fourteen hundreds, these were a vital tool for people, and again, it allowed for more explorations, particularly of coastlines. Okay, so a, 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 along a lot of these. Explore, explorers would have had cartographers on board their ships and these are these are people who would draw coastlines and draw out accurate depictions um of the coastline and maps for for the next people for, for the next group of sailors i suppose to use so they would have an accurate idea of what the coastline will look like so how did these things contribute to historical change so how did your caravel your compass your map your quadrant, your astrolabe, how did these contribute to historical change? Guys, these are hugely, hugely significant. Okay. Firstly, it revolutionized European transportation. Um, I suppose compasses, maps, quadrants, astrolabes allowed explorers to pinpoint exactly where they were and how far they traveled. Again, giving explorers the kind of confidence to do to, to go on these large scale explorations and safe in the knowledge that they know that they're going to know how far they traveled. Okay. Um, second point is, was the caravel ship allowed easier and safer exploration. Okay. And this allowed more voyages of discovery. Again, it just gave kings and queens and explorers the confidence to go and explore. Okay. Um, you know, previously dangerous things such as rough seas, shallow water, and rugged coastlines were now easier to traverse. All right. Now, the main change, I suppose, was that the, all these advances led to the contribution, um, I suppose, contributed to the rapid conquest and colonization of the New World. So, like your Christopher Columbus. Um, Francisco Pizarro, Hernando Cortes, Ferdinand Magellan, all these people, these, these explorers were allowed to conquer, you know, the likes of the Americas and the, the Incas, the Aztecs. These civilizations were conquered as a result of these revolutionary forms of transport and navigation. OK, so on your sample answer, guys, like, you know, you, you can you can elaborate on that easily. OK, you know, you, you could bring it in to say how, for example, um, it led to the spreading of new diseases. OK, for example, smallpox would spread throughout South and Central America because it was brought over by explorers, brought over by, you, you know, European explorers. OK, um, genocide, you know, millions of these people were killed through murder, mistreatment, or being forced to work in mines or plantations by European colonizers. Okay, you can mention the spread of religion. The Christian religion spread throughout South, Central, and North America because it was brought over by Christian explorers. Okay, so, you know, there's loads, we could draw on loads of our knowledge on the age of explorations here to talk about how they contributed to historical change, how, how, how boats, compasses, Caribals would contribute to historical change. Our third technological advance which contributed to historical change is the steam engine. Very, very significant invention. So 
The first steam engine was invented by a man called Thomas Newcomen. Okay, now in 1778, a man called James Watt would improve it by adding a separate condenser. So have a think, what are all the things you know of that are steam powered? Well, probably not anymore, but back in the past, well, trains were steam powered. Many factories were steam powered. Okay, um, so steam power was vital. Okay, and we're going to see how steam power had a huge impact on, I suppose, te uh, technological change. So the steam engine was massive and made big contributions to historical change. So the steam engine led to the growth of the coal mining industry. Okay, so Britain, for example, became a massive coal mining country. All right, so steam power allowed for deeper mine shafts and more coal extraction. So there would be steam engines literally in mine shafts helping to ferry coal up and back. Okay, um, so it meant for it meant for more mining. Now, steam engines were also coal powered. So again, that further led to, I suppose, more coal mining because, like, not only could steam power actually mean meant that coal mining was more efficient, but steam power worked from coal. Okay, so they they burnt they they burnt coal and this generated steam. And this would create would create movement. This would this would create propulsion that could move engines and things forward. So steam engines were coal powered, which led to the further growth of the coal mining industry. Now this would lead to a major major boost and and I suppose growth and development in British industry. And this is not only as the industrial revolution. Okay, so. The steam engine powered factories and mills during the Industrial Revolution. Prior to this, now, all factories and mills were driven by some kind of moving water. Okay, so what I mean by that is, like, they had to be located along a river. As the river moved, it would, it would move a mill, and this would power a factory. Okay, but steam power revolutionized this, and steam power meant that factories could now be built anywhere Whereas, as we said, previous factories had to be built along rivers. All right. And um, by the end of the 1800s, about 90 percent of British horsepower was steam power. So that just shows you how quickly it became, I suppose, widespread. OK, 90 percent of British horsepower was steam power. And the final 10 percent was probably was probably was probably water mills. OK, another way it contributed to historical change, I suppose, is. It contributed to the growth of towns and cities. Okay, have a think about it. Where are people going to want to work? They're going to want to work in factories. This is where the money was. It was difficult to work as a farmer. So a lot of towns and cities shot up and grew very rapidly because of steam power. Okay, because of, of, of steam power, it meant factories grew and towns would inevitably grow around them. Now, an unfortunate aspect of this is child labor. Child labor became very, very common. We can actually see here, there's a young girl working in a, a, a factory that's producing cloth, okay, in, in a loom factory. All right. So it's quite, quite a, an unfortunate aspect was, was the growth in child labor. A lot of children were small and they could work, you know, they could get into nooks and crannies where older, bigger people couldn't. For example, down a mine shaft, a lot of young boys were sent to work down mine shafts because they could easily get deep into the mine shaft, whereas a fully grown man couldn't. So we mentioned at the beginning that not only did steam power power factories, but steam power also power trains. OK, so the steam powered locomotive ro railway. So the first railway lines began to open and these were steam powered. OK, um, the first passenger line in Britain was built between Manchester and Liverpool in 1830. OK, and here this is an image of it here. All right. So the previous, you know, previous to this, if you were traveling from Manchester to Liverpool, you either had to walk it, which would take it forever, or you'd get a horse and carriage. Okay. Um, so this this had a steam engine, steam power had a massive impact on locomotive railways. So steam powered railways allowed for faster, affordable transport. All right. So, you know, now affordable, it still was probably out of reach for most people, but it gradually became to become it gradually, I suppose, became 
more and more viable for people to use, to, 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 to use steam engines as they developed and got a bit cheaper. Now, this actually led to a huge increase in trade and tourism in Britain. Okay, so a lot of trading was done. A lot of, for example, coal would have been shipped between fact, you know, from mine to factory by a steam engine. Right. Okay. Now, an interesting one is tourism. So a lot of tourism began to become popular, and a lot of tourist towns became popular because of steam steam engines. So, for example, Brighton, Brighton in the south of England, Portsmouth, okay, Blackpool. These were all seaside towns. That became, you know, they obviously had nice beaches. They were down near the south. They got nice weather. And these towns became popular because of the steam engine, because people could get to them. People could get to them. Remember, this is back when it was very, very difficult to go abroad. There was no airplanes. So people could actually get to these towns for a holiday. And that led to the growth of tourism. A lot of tourist towns began popping up with the help of the steam, the locomotive steam engine. So the steam engine didn't just have an impact on land. The steam engine also had an impact on water. Okay, so steam power boats became popular and these revolutionized river and sea transport. So previous to this, like if you were moving along a river, you're relying on the, the, the moving current of water or wind or literally oars to, to propel you along. And that was the same. Think of the caravel. The caravel, you know, sailing from Europe to the Americas relied on wind. Okay, so steamboats revolutionized river and sea transport. In 1807, the first steamboat, the Claremont, carried passengers along the Hudson River between Albany and New York City. All right, and it, this was huge. So previously, this journey would take five days for a wind-powered boat, but because of the the steam power that the that the Claremont boat had. This journey now only took 32 hours. Okay, so here we can see it here. It's got like, um, a, 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 I suppose, a propeller here. Okay, and that is being driven by steam power. Now, this, not only did this revolutionize kind of localized transport, you know, in one country, but it also led to the rapid emigration, that rapid movement of people, particularly from Europe to the Americas. So, Millions of Europeans emigrated to the Americas in the second half of the 19th century as the steamboat made the journey shorter and less expensive. OK, so really, really, I suppose, huge. It, it's really shaped the, the United States, as we know today. But you think of all the communities in, in America, Italians, Irish, Eastern Europeans, um, you know, like their descendants, their ancestors probably made the journey over on a steamboat. OK, now, during the famine, we know a lot of people made the journey from Ireland to America during the famine on what were ships that were inf infamously known as carbon ships. Now, most of those ships would not have been steamboats because at, at the time, steamboats still would have been only kind of available for the wealthy people. So the poor Irish people would not be able to afford those, um, I suppose, those, th that journey on, on, on a steamboat. They would be going on the you know the coffin ships the the wind powered ships which again took a lot longer and as a result the, the journey was more treacherous so the final i suppose technological advancement we're going to look at is the airplane okay and the airplane you know we know ourselves this was massive when it came to technology okay and historical change so the first airplane was invented by the Wright brothers. So you probably heard of these guys, Wilbur and Orville Wright. So on the 17th of December, 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright completed the first ever flight in a power driven airplane. And this is it here. Okay, so really, really impressive stuff. By 1908, the Wright brothers had received a patent for the design of their airplane. So that meant that basically they owned the design of the plane. No one else could copy it. All right. And again, if you look at the plane, like it kind of, you know, it's it's designed off a bird. OK, like they mimic the design of a bird's wingspan because a bird was obviously the only thing that was flying at the time. So they, they kind of copied the idea of a bird's wingspan for the design. Now, like in the space of a few years, planes became very widespread. OK, and we're going to look at this now. So. It's amazing how quickly the plane developed, okay? Uh, we've got a few examples of it here. So on the 1st of January, 1914, the first passenger flight took place 
when a man called Tony Janis flew from St. Petersburg to Tampa in Florida. And that's St. Petersburg in in America, not, not, not in Russia now. Okay. And that was the first ever passenger flight. Okay. Now, just five years later, in June 1919, these two men carried out, you know, kind of, it kind of like nearly the modern day version of the age of expir- explorations. Okay. British aviators John Alcock and Arthur Brown made the first ever non stop transatlantic flight. Okay. So, really incredible achievement. Like to fly from, you know, across the Atlantic Ocean, they flew from Newfoundland, Canada to Clifton in Galway. Okay. So, you know, that would have been a very, very brave thing to do. Like, the, you know, if those guys went down, ran out of fuel or, you know, had an accident over the Atlantic Ocean, they were dead. There was no one coming to save them. Okay. So really, really incredible achievement. And I suppose, again, a first, it's a major first to do that, to carry out that flight. So you have aviators span Atlantic, English birdmen make long leap without stop. Okay. Um, Alcock and Brown cross an ocean in 16 hours and 12 minutes. So quite, you know, quite a long, quite a long trip. Probably that trip would, would, would be less than half that now. Probably five, a five hour trip now. Okay. But really, really incredible. And just a, an idea of, of, of what, you know, how, how quickly aviation developed. This is only 15, maybe 15 years after Wilbur and Orville Wright um, kind of were really, I suppose, you know, fit, getting the patent for their plane, etc., and, and starting to develop and sell their plane. So how did the airplane contribute to historical change? Well, firstly, as you know, airplanes have made our planet extremely accessible and has led to a huge increase in overseas tourism. Like particularly in the last 20 or 30 years, guys, think of planes like you can fly really anywhere in the world for, you know, yeah, a, a, a quick fee you pay online. You can fly anywhere within a matter of hours. The world is so accessible now. OK, you know, particularly you take a Ryanair, for example, nowadays, like Ryanair have allowed quick, cheap and easy transport to really any European destination. OK, so airplanes have made a planet very accessible. Um, airplanes have resulted in a massive increase in trade over the course of the 20th century. Okay. And it, this has done wonders for us when it comes to, to food supply. Um, it has allowed us to have access to greater amounts of food. So, like, we're no longer as countries reliant on the food that we just grow ourselves. Okay. So, like, you go to the supermarket, look at the back of, of, of a package. Like, most food now is grown abroad and we fly it in here. Okay, and again, that's thanks to planes. You think a lot of food is perishable, so I wouldn't, you wouldn't really be able to fly a lot of food via boat because, or I suppose, transport it via boat because it would go off. So planes can allow food to to move extremely quickly. Okay, before it, I suppose, will perish or or or, or go bad. Okay, so huge increase in trade. It's not just food; like a lot of other things as well. Okay, most of the things we use are made abroad. And again, these are transported, a lot, a lot of these items are transported via airplane to our country. Okay. So again, airplanes, they've made our planet very accessible, um, a big increase in overseas tourism, a massive increase in trade and better access to food. Now, another way airplanes have contributed to historical change, probably negative, a big negative one is warfare. So it's mad, like we, we said that Wilbur and Orville Wright did the first ever solo flight in their plane. Um, in 1903. By 1914, 1915, uh, militaries were using planes in warfare. Um, they took part in dogfights um, you know, in the air against one another. Okay. Now, in World War I, most planes were just used to fight. You know, They were used on the battlefield. But in World War II, the use of airplanes changed greatly. Okay. So airplanes would begin to play a major role in warfare in the 20th century. So basically, airplanes made civilians big targets in war. Okay. Whereas before, you know, most of the fighting was done just on a battlefield between two armies, civilians were for the most part kind of left untouched. This changed greatly um, following the outbreak of World War II. Okay. So in World War II, planes such as the American B 29 bomber and the British Lancaster bomber 
could fly long distances and drop bombs on military and civilian targets. So this meant it really increased the death toll. Okay, it led to a large increase in death and destruction during the war as civilians became targets. Like you look at the war, World War One, you know, probably 16 to 18 million people killed in World War Two, that number shot up to 60 million. And okay, it's hard to compare two different conflicts, but definitely we can uh, say a part of the reason for such an increase in death toll in World War Two was um, aerial warfare. Planes being able to drop huge amounts of bombs and ordnance on cities and towns where civilians, unfortunately, were caught up in it, okay? So we're going to look at some examples of this. Well, we know that World War II came to an end officially when the U.S. dropped the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, you know, huge death toll. So it is estimated roughly 70,000 to 135,000 people died in Hiroshima. And 60,000 to 80,000 people died in Nagasaki. And some of these, I suppose, were people who died immediately following the nuclear, the, the, the nuclear blast. And some of them died from long-term side effects of radiation. So a really, really, you know, horrific, I suppose, um, I suppose negative, horrific impact of, of airplanes. And again, like that's done, think about it. Guys, like that's done by, you know, pilots just literally pressing a button to drop a bomb. OK, it's done so, I suppose, easily with the death and suffering and destruction is so big. OK, um, we also as well have other examples. So, for example, um, the Nazis, before they, they tried to invade Britain, they began bombing British cities in what was known as the Blitz. 40,000 British civilians were killed during the Blitz because of Luftwaffe air raids, okay? And these air raids were specifically, they specifically targeted major British cities, London, Manchester, Liverpool, etc. Okay, so huge, huge death toll here. And again, you know, bringing civilians onto the, you know, as, as big targets, which they previously hadn't been, okay? Another example we can look at is the Allied bombing of the German medieval industrial city of Dresden. Uh, we 25,000 people were killed over a, a four or five day period because of allied firebombs. OK, so, you know, really, really nasty stuff. And I suppose uh, quite a big a negative impact of of warfare. OK, so airplanes have played a major part in warfare. World War Two, you know, like, like in World War Two, we mentioned 60 million people died. Uh, most of those were civilians, you know, and again, why? Probably a good reason because of planes, because planes could just easily drop huge amounts of bombs on civilian targets and unfortunately civilians get killed. So, guys, the key thing is we need to be able to condense this information into a sample answer that we can use. OK, so again, just a, a reminder of our question, discuss three technological innovations that you have studied and explain how they contributed to historical change okay so we're going to go through three innovations and talk about how they've contributed to historical change so three innovations i have studied are the printing press the caribou ship and the airplane okay so there's the three i've picked now like you know there's absolutely no you don't have to do them you can easily pick the printing press the steam engine and the airplane okay that's absolutely fine so what I have done here is straight away, I have named my three technological innovations. Name them straight away. Let the examiner know that you know what you're talking about right from the off. OK, and now the first few lines or paragraph we're going to talk about is the printing press. OK, so the printing press was invented by Johannes Gutenberg in the mid 1400s and worked by using movable type. OK, so again, a, a, a brief, you know, description uh, in terms of the printing press. The question is not really asking us much. The, the, the main thing the question is asking us is how they contribute to historical change. That's what we need to focus on. So a brief description of what the printing press is, who invented it. Now, how did this contribute to historical change? OK, so a big thing. We'll make a few points on this. So the printing press made big contributions to historical change. OK, how? Well, first of all, printed books became much cheaper and literacy levels increased. The influence of the Catholic Church also declined as reformers such as Martin Luther used the printing press to distribute anti-Catholic materials, for example, his 95 Thesis. And that's fine. That's, that, that's a perfect amount for the first third of this answer. Now, you don't have to use those points I use. 
you could mention, for example, how the printing press led to, uh, I suppose, the growing popularity of literature. And give an example, for example, writers such as William Shakespeare became popular because people now had access to their literature and their writing. Okay, so that's our first bit done on the printing press. So our second piece of technological, I suppose, development or technological advances is the Caraval ship. Okay, so the Caraval ship was clinker built. It had square and lateen sails and had rudders which aided steering. Okay, good. So we've mentioned why the Caraval ship was good. Like, why was it a good ship? Okay, now, how did it revolutionize European transportation? Well, the strength and maneuverability of the Caraval made it uh, allowed easier and safer exploration. These advances would ultimately contribute to the rapid conquest and colonization of the new world in the Americas. Absolutely perfect. Okay, now again, if we wanted to, we could elaborate this further. Okay, we could mention how it led to the spread of Christianity, the spread of diseases, the decline of native peoples. Okay, but what we have here is absolutely fine. Okay. Um, now, if you wanted to, you could again mention your navigation equipment, okay? But the key thing, and just pick, the, the question's asking for tree developments, okay? So pick tree concrete developments, your printing press, your caravel ship, your airplane, and talk about those in detail, okay? As opposed to maybe, you know, talking a small bit about one or two uh, extra ones, just pick tree. So again, we're now going to talk about the airplane, which you've just done. So the final technological innovation I have studied is the airplane. Okay, again, a bit of a background. Who invented it? What's the story with the airplane? Well, on the 70th of December, 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright completed the first ever flight in a power-driven airplane. Um, now, why? How did the airplane contribute to historical change? Well, it helped to revolutionize global transport. How? Well, overseas tourism became extremely common as airplanes made the planet very accessible. Again, we can kind of get to anywhere in the world, really, in a matter of hours. Okay. Um, the invention of the airplane also created a new age in warfare as civilians became targets for bombing raids, particularly in World War II. Okay. So perfect answer there, guys. Again, if we want, absolutely, we can elaborate on it. Okay. We can talk about say how civilians became targets we can <coughs> give a specific example hiroshima nagasaki dresden um we could talk about um you know the blitz okay the battle of britain absolutely fine so guys what i'd like you to do is now not use don't copy my answer i'd like you to go back and do that question yourself as practice but use different information what I put in my answer. 